Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Textile Talks. I'm Carolyn Ducey, the artist B. James Curator of Collections at the International Quilt Museum, and we are pleased to host today's event. Textile Talks is brought to you by the following organizations, the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Association, and Surface Design Association. Textile Talks is offered free to attendees thanks to our generous sponsors. Our platinum level sponsors are Moda Fabrics and Supplies and Quilting Daily. The silver level sponsors are eQuilter.com and Orafil. And our bronze level sponsors are Artistic Artifacts, Misty Fuse, Schiffer Publishing, Clover, Nine Patch Fabrics, Exotic Silk slash Thai Silks, Empty Spool Seminars, Quilt Mania, and The Quilt Show. We would respectfully ask you today to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants during our program. Please use the Q&A tab in Zoom for questions, use the chat box for greeting others, and the survey tab for commentary or ways we can improve. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button to toggle them off and on. We are experimenting with a new Zoom feature, live captions. We're excited that this will make textile talks accessible to a wider audience. But if you prefer not to view the captions, you should be able to turn them off. Thank you and enjoy today's presentation. Today's program is United in Memory, 20 years after 9-11 and is presented by my colleague, Jonathan Gregory. Jonathan Gregory earned an MA in textile history and a PhD in human sciences from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. His research, curatorial work and writing pursue 20th century American quilt making, particularly in relation to social engagement and meaning making. Jonathan is assistant curator of exhibitions at the IQM and has led production of its many exhibition projects. He has contributed to several IQM publications, including American Quilts in the Modern Age, 1870 to 1940, 2009, What's in a Name, Inscribed Quilts, 2012, and American Quilts in the Industrial Age, 1760 to 1870, published in 2018. He is also a contributor to the IQM's World Quilts website at worldquilts.quiltstudy.org. Jonathan Gregory curated the IQM's current exhibition, Trying to Make Sense of It, 9-11, Loss and Memorial Quilts currently on view at the IQM through October 16th. This Friday, the IQM is offering passage or memory quilting through life's transitions with Sherry Lynn Wood. It is Friday, September 3rd from 5.30 to 6.30 Central Time. This is a free event, both in person and available by live stream at the International Quilt Museum's Facebook page. For more details and links, please go to the International Quilt Museum's internationalquiltmuseum.org and navigate the visit tab to find our events calendar. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Gregory. Thank you, Carolyn. Appreciate your introduction. And uh, hello to all of you in attending today's textile talk. I have enjoyed presenting uh, talks before, and uh, this one is especially um, meaningful to me uh, because of, I think, reasons that you'll see as we get into the talk. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, we have just opened an exhibition uh, here at the International Quilt Museum titled Trying to Make Sense of It, 9-11 Loss and Memorial Quilts. We've been working on this exhibition uh, in the planning stages since 2015. 
uh, we wanted to have some sort of a special exhibition that would commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks uh, this September. As Carolyn mentions, this exhibition is open through October 16th, but I wanted to add here at the beginning that there are portions of this exhibition that will be closing on October 2nd and October 9th to accommodate our exhibition schedule. So if you plan to come in person, I encourage you to make your plans with this in mind. Um, this exhibition, trying to make sense of it, is anchored by the United in Memory 9-11 Victims Memorial Quilt, which came into the IQM collection in 2015. This quilt is actually comprised of 143 panels that commemorate each of the 2,977 individuals who died in the terrorist attacks on 9-11, whether at the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, or as occupants of the four aircraft that were used as weapons that day. The United in Memory 9-11 Victims Memorial Quilt, um, as I said, is made up of 143 panels. Each panel is a full quilt that's 10 foot by 10 foot, containing a five by five grid of blocks. Um, it does contain every name of all those who lost their lives in the, uh, in the attacks that day. Each block is 18 inches square. There were 3,600 volunteers who contributed blocks or assembled these quilt panels. And these volunteers came from 18 different countries. The entire quilt is more than 15,000 square feet. And the quilt panels began touring the United States in 2002. Now the backstory for this quilt begins um, at the Ground Zero or the World Trade Center site in Lower Manhattan. Um, Corey Gamel and Peter Marquez, the founders of the United in Memory Quilt, visited Ground Zero just three weeks after the attacks. And Gamel said about his experience there, the images that you see on television, on the internet, and in pictures cannot compare to being confronted with it in person. Being there, smelling the smoldering remains, and seeing the pile of rubble was unbelievable. Following that experience, Corey and Peter felt people needed a way to soothe themselves following the events of 9-11. Corey envisioned um, making a quilt similar to the world famous AIDS Memorial Quilt. So upon their return to Los Angeles or to Long Beach, California, they founded the United in Memory 9-11 Victims Memorial Quilt Incorporated as an all-volunteer grassroots organization whose goal was to create a quilt that would serve as a lasting tribute to all those who died on 9-11. They spread the word through a website uh, as a way to invite people to participate by making blocks dedicated to each of the people who perished that day. Corey recruited additional help from approximately 40 core volunteers led by Carol Allison of Cerritos, California. This core volunteer assembled the blocks into quilts during the summer of 2002. And the quilt began traveling later that year, as I mentioned. Here it is pictured at St. John's University on Staten Island, New York on the 10th anniversary in 2011. In 2015, the quilt came into the IQM education collection. Gamel says the motto of the project is honoring the victims, comforting the world. And he says it, the quilt serves as a healing balm to our wounded spirits and as an eternal beacon, reaffirming our respect for life and freedom and inspiring an end to hatred, bigotry, ignorance, and intolerance. Shortly after the IQM acquired this project, we installed a, uh, a small installation of seven panels 
in 2016 to commemorate the 15th anniversary of 9-11. That same year, another group of panels traveled to the International Quilt Festival for display in Houston, Texas. I worked on that 2016 exhibition and drew a parallel with the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in which each member of the US Armed Services, Armed Forces who died in that conflict is named in order of death without any reference to their rank, their citizenship, or their race. The black granite wall of the Vietnam Memorial It broke, the black granite wall of the Vietnam Memorial broke with all wartime memorial traditions that honored the great men with statues or created such things as collective memorials, like what we have here in Lincoln in our Memorial Stadium, which honors the Nebraskans who perished in World War I, or memorials like the one shown here that honor all without their names but they are subsumed within an official narrative. In our 2016 exhibition, we included all 2,977 names in alphabetical order without regard to their citizenship, their gender, their social or economic status, or without their regard to their roles as first responders or occupants of the buildings or the aircraft. The blocks of the quilt, however, highlight the individualness of each person's loss, and they provide a narrative or a brief story of each person's identity through photographs, symbols, words, color. They tell stories of them as members of families, as employees of particular companies, as first responders who risked and lost their lives for the sake of others. Our printed and alphabetized names emphasize the collective loss, the magnitude of the simultaneousness of those losses. The names panels allow the visitor a point of reference for the enormity of loss, while the individual blocks narrate the briefest of stories. These narratives were created by those who knew them best, their family members, their friends, and when those were not able to create the blocks, volunteers did all they could to create a meaningful block. But now to 2021, as we began to prepare in earnest for this exhibition for the 20th anniversary, we had at first hoped to display uh, 20 of the panels from the United in Memory 9-11 Victims Memorial Quilt as a way to honor all those who died and to commemorate the events of that day. But as late last year, as we began to have discussions, we were still in the lockdown from COVID-19 um, and there had been several, a few hundred thousand people die from that uh, pandemic. Also the murder of George Floyd or a report of some other fatality of a black person in an interaction with law enforcement seemed to be a daily presence in our newscasts. And we were just coming off of a contentious presidential election and election cycle. So we asked ourselves, how should we commemorate the 20th anniversary of 9-11 in the fact of current events and in light of the fact that 80 million Americans had been born since 9-11 and they had no direct experience with the events of that day. So as we talked, we began to discuss amongst ourselves how quilts have been used so often throughout American history to signify events within communities. And we reflected on our own experiences of trying to come to some sort of terms with what we were experiencing during the pandemic. Thinking of friends or acquaintances who, uh, thinking of friends or acquaintances who died, of people who were unable to be with their loved ones uh, who were dying of COVID, 
we ourselves were able to remember what we felt and where we were on 9-11 and the similarities to what we were feeling with the events of 2020. We were just trying to make sense of it all, really. And we knew that our visitors would be too. So we let that phrase, trying to make sense of it, be our organizing idea. We determined to focus on the unique ways that quilts have functioned to help people deal with loss in the past and today. And we settled on three themes to organize this exhibition, to give some sort of a structure. That first theme is the collective is personal. In this gallery, uh, this exhibition is made of three adjoining galleries. In this gallery, the collective is personal. We focus mostly on 9-11 and the wars that ensued shortly thereafter. While 9-11 and the casualties of war have persistently been interpreted as part of our national American story and given meaning when viewed as sacrifices for or because of our ideals and values that transcend the individual, it's the persistence of the individualness of the loss that we wanted to highlight here. For example, I recall that later in the day on 9-11, 2001, people began leaving flowers, notes, and photos as impromptu personal memorials in parks and along fences near the sites. These were the first that sort of the grassroots, the memorials from the ground up. The blocks in the 9-11 quilts have some of this character. And since we were not able to hang all 143 panels, and I want to add here that those panels not hanging here at the International Quilt Museum will be exhibited at St. John's University on Staten Island for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So we partnered to create an interactive kiosk where visitors can search for any name or browse the blocks in all 143 panels. In this way, we have brought each person who died that day into our gallery that we may honor and commemorate them. Our second theme is that the personal is universal. So death and grief are common experiences of all humanity whether that death comes uh, following a long period of declining health or suddenly and without warning in some way or in the service of one's country. While the particulars vary, every culture, community and family has established practices that their members use to mourn their losses and to honor and remember those who have died. One practice among peoples in Central Asia is tying bits of cloth to trees and bushes to ward off dangerous forces, particularly near the tombs of those considered important people. We adapted this tradition for the gallery, providing fabric leaves on which visitors may write a memorial note and then tie it to the tree. In the short time the exhibition has been open, the trees are already filling with beautiful words on colorful leaves. And I wish I had time to share some of these with you, but I don't today. Another tradition from elsewhere that we incorporated is in a piece made by the late multimedia artist Carol Westfall. She made a series of what she called Joss quilts. Joss paper, typically made from coarse bamboo, is cut into rectangles and often decorated with seals, stamps, or engraving and sometimes with gold or silver foil. And in those cases, it's called spirit money. And when it is burned, it's believed to supply ancestors' needs in the afterlife. The underlying belief is that the burning allows the offering to cross from the natural world to the spirit world. Carol Westfall made these quilts to honor her own ancestors. And she did burn one of them as a tribute to those ancestors. The remainder became part of our collection. 
Sherry Lynn Wood, who Carolyn mentioned, is, will be presenting a program here uh, this Friday evening. She has something she calls passage quilts, and it's a very personal tradition. Um, it's the tradition that has existed for a long time, periods of time of taking deceased clothing and personal items and crafting them into a quilt. Often incorporated are uh, clothing selected by the survivors that have particular meaning about the family member or remind them of events of their life together. These quilts, when finished, also provide a way to be hugged, so to speak, by the one who is gone, by being wrapped in their clothing, much like we might have been when someone hugs us, uh, when a loved one hugged us when they were alive. Also, these pieces can change in their meaning to the owners over time. This quilt was made for Kendra, and she received the quilt just two years after her mother died. Her mother was Patty, and Kendra was just starting college at the time. And she told me, I was still grieving heavily. I couldn't really grasp how special it was because it was very painful to look at the quilt. She was dealing with a lot of grief and anger that was associated with that grief. And for a time, this was a really difficult object for her. Now, these years later, remind her of her mother. And she says that now that I'm an adult, the quilt's meaning to me is of a mother's enduring love after death. You know that love endures forever. She's still with me. I can feel her. Yet another way that memorial quilts are personal is by making the names of the deceased prominent. The AIDS memorial quilt exemplifies this best of all. The official name of the quilt is the Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt. And each three foot by six foot panel names one person in most cases. The quilt pictured here is actually an exception. The AIDS quilt is the contemporary progenitor of many other quilts and quilt projects that center the individualness of each death in their purposes. Corey Gamel was able to imagine the creation of the United in Memory 9-11 Victims Memorial Quilt because he knew of the AIDS quilt. 13-year-old Madeline Fouget found inspiration in the AIDS quilt when she founded the COVID Memorial Quilt in early 2020. Her mother, Catherine, had shared with Madeline her experiences years earlier making panels to commemorate commemorate her friends who died in the AIDS epidemic. Madeline reached out to AIDS Memorial Quilt Organization and was able to speak with Cleve Jones, the founder, to ask his advice for her project. Still a young project, the COVID Memorial Quilt has received and made quilts incorporating over 500 blocks. Our third theme is that the personal is collective. If we examine the 9-11 Victims Memorial Quilt, we see many names of fire, police, and other first responders. They were disproportionately affected by the disaster because of the, of the nature of their work. They have been called heroes because they risked and lost their lives in attempting to save the lives of others. This group, seen collectively, calls attention to the nature of their work and the character of the individuals who chose this line of work. Another way in which individual deaths point to being considered collectively is when those deaths align with factors of that person's identity or social circumstances. The story of each person's life and death is unique. Yet there are factors that contribute disproportionately to the death of persons of color, of certain ethnic, religious, sexual, gender, or disadvantaged communities. In recent times, artists have used quilts to publicly name the victims of these deaths, raise awareness of the need for change, and engage in calling for justice. This exhibition includes several of these works that show the ways that makers have responded to these losses. A pair of quilts 
interact with the death of Black Americans. The first is Yesterday, Civil Rights in the South by folk artist Yvonne Wells. In this, she uses visual narratives to tell of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. She's represented the four girls who were killed in the 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, a bombing that was perpetrated by the Ku Klux Klan. She's also included depictions of the murder of black and white civil rights workers in 1965, also lynchings and racially motivated murders committed by law enforcement and Ku Klux Klan members. These killings in 1960 were rarely prosecuted and those that were, were rarely resulted in convictions. A piece made just last year is one called Cakewalk, made by the Darn Studio, who is David Anthone and Ron Norsworthy. They styled their artwork completely of matchbooks, stitched into a symbolic patchwork pattern to commemorate the deaths of Black Americans in interactions with law enforcement. Those named on this quilt are Laquan McDonald from Chicago, Freddie Gray in Baltimore, Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina, Charlena Lyles in Seattle, and Botham Jean in Dallas. This piece is a part of a series created by these artists commemorating Black Americans. Cakewalk takes its name from competitions in which enslaved Black Americans performed exaggerated dances caricaturing the gestures, dances, and social customs of their white plantation owners. The owners awarded a cake, thus the name Cakewalk, to the winner, unaware of the clever ways the dances mocked them and performed enslaved people's navigation of racial inequality. Today, Cakewalk means an easy task or a victory, but to which the artists have responded, Navigating racism is no cakewalk for Black people. Susan Hudson has created a memorial to all Indigenous people who have lost their lives to violence since European contact in 1492. While quilt makers often sew clothing of the deceased into memorial quilts, Susan, a textile artist and activist, states examples of clothing that represent all the missing and murdered Indigenous women from, as she said, the past, present, and future. She uses her quilts and art, her quilt art to work to stop racially motivated violence, murder, kidnapping, sex trafficking, rape, and forced sterilizations of Indigenous people, things which have been happening in the Americas since European contact. In conclusion, we find the United in Memory 9-11 Victims Memorial Quilt, we find in that quilt how all the themes find expression, the collective, the personal, and the universal. But the universal seems to, to me is the most hopeful part. In quilts, we do see a full range of expressions in the, of the shared human experience of being connected and the pain when those connections are severed, whether by coming to the end of one's days after a long life, a premature end due to disease, or a violent end in war, violence, or hatred. We who survive, who see in cloth and the textile traditions of our cultures avenues of expression, use them to express our grief, to record our memories, to process our disbelief and try to make sense of living with the loss. We stitch narratives that name the dead, document their lives and value, and send these into our society's conversations about love and family, national values and individual tragedy, shared humanity and persistent inequalities. 
Quilts have been and continue to be versatile and welcoming objects for all these expressions. And that, that is the end of my prepared remarks. Um, and Carolyn, I'll turn it back to you for us to start our discussion. Thanks, Jonathan. This is a, a, a really moving show. And I just want to say that I, I know it has not been an easy one for you to produce. And um, I, I appreciate all the work you've done on this show so much. Um, Thank you. I, I was curious. Um, we know that, um, well, I, I was hopeful that you could talk to us a little bit more about how quilts have been used because the, the most of the quilts that we are showing in this exhibition are more current shows or current, current quilts, but this has been a tradition throughout um, quilt history um, in the United States and around the world. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the kind of the history of this and how this has been a, a way of, of dealing with grief throughout history? I can, yes. Um... I, um, I have some uh, slides that didn't make the cut <laughs> and I can try to pull them up here um, and uh, share a little bit. They're not, uh, they're not the best looking. Is that okay, you think? I think that'd be wonderful. Okay, um, well, we'll just do that. So, Just a moment while I get this uh, set up. I thank you for your patience here. Just making some tiny changes. Okay, here we go. So uh, these are small images. Um, and Carolyn, you know this quilt quite well. I do love this quilt so much. So this is a quilt made, uh, I believe, in the 1840s. Right. Uh, in uh, Philadelphia. And it's the Wistar family quilt. Um, it was made and given uh, to, uh, we think, one woman who was a single, a member of a Quaker community, who was quite involved in her community, uh, both in, the, in religious practice, but also in social issues uh, and social service. Um, so here's uh, what I'm showing here is the tradition of using quilts um, to uh, advocate for particular causes or to signify um, the meaningfulness of other people in a community. So uh, one of the blocks in this quilt is says, remember the slave. And as a Quaker, she was an abolitionist. And these sentiments uh, were included in the quilt. Let's see if we can get another block here. There we go. Uh, also on this quilt is a small quilt, um, a small image inked uh, in support of William Henry Harrison who was the president of the United States, who uh, elected March or installed March 4th, 1841. Um, so it, it uh, reveals her political viewpoints. Again, a way to express something that has some public significance or uh, tells her role within society. Um, and these are not quite in order. So here, we'll go back to this one. This is a quilt also from the 1840s, and this is a memorial quilt, uh, a Baltimore album style uh, that 
commemorates uh, two officers who died in the Mexican-American War. One is Thomas Ringgold, and the other is uh, one named Watson, whose first name I have forgotten. Uh, but we see these uh, depictions of stone monuments with uh, American flags on each side. There are guns resting uh, along each side, uh, symbols of their military uh, uh, service. There's also cactus, which is something that entered, uh, is symbolic it, of that time period and that particular war because cactuses became something that uh, became a house plant, started to be domesticated in homes uh, after our presence in Mexico when they were brought home. Um, that's a little free bit I have for you there. But uh, to add here, uh, this is sort of that, uh, the sort of great man memorial where it calls attention to the, the people who are high ranked and they their names are given, but all the others who, who were casualties in that war, they're obviously missing here. But by 1865 and the, the American Civil War, um, we, see, <coughs> we see that somewhat changing. This is a quilt that was made in Hingham, Massachusetts um, and was contributed uh, by the ladies, the Fort Hill Ladies Sewing Circle in Hingham to the US Sanitary Commission. And this, uh, the Sanitary Commission uh, collected quilts that they used um, to send to field hospitals to care for soldiers who had been wounded, uh, Union soldiers in this case. And there are inscriptions all over this quilt and some of them are very directly uh, written to the soldier. Uh, one says, Aunt Betsy, the soldier's friend. Others have uh, moralistic or religious sayings uh, to encourage the young men. Um, but here it's, these quilts are meant to be very personal. It is not a memorial quilt, so to speak, however. Uh, in a later war, in the World War I, uh, there were many fundraising quilts made. And this one was made to raise funds for the American Red Cross. Um, each name that's embroidered here in red uh, thread is uh, had paid or someone paid to have their name embroidered there. And then typically these quilts would be auctioned, raising additional funds. Um, and then those funds would be contributed to the Red Cross. Um, this, I'm sorry, I have uh, some extraneous text here. This is a quilt that I showed you a detail of earlier that has gold stars. Um, during World War I, uh, we started to see quilts show up with embroidered names like the fundraisers. And this in fact is a fundraiser. Uh, the red names uh, that are embroidered here signify those who gave funds to have their name included. The blue names are those of soldiers who served in the American Armed Forces uh, in this case from Denver, Colorado. And a few of those soldiers have gold stars embroidered by their names, indicating that they died in the war. So this is a multifunction quilt. And I wanna bring it up to uh, contemporary times. This is um, called the Monument Quilt. And this is a quilt uh, call attention to sexual abuse and to honor those who are survivors. Here it is displayed in the, uh, on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., much like the AIDS quilt was. Um, and it's arranged in ways that you can see here uh, to send a message to, uh, to these survivors, a positive and a, a supportive message to them. So uh, Carolyn, that's, I hope that's um, kind of filling in that gap Absolutely. And, and, and we did not plan that. And I appreciate that you had those slides to show because I think this has been such a tradition in quilting over time. Right. And um, 
so I, I just wanted to ask one question, and, and this isn't really your opinion, but why do you think people make quilts to express that kind of grief and that depth of feeling? What is it about quilts? I, people ask me this question all the time, and I don't yeah. know that I really have a great explanation. I wondered what you thought. Yeah, you know, I think I think if we had an answer, it might make quilts a little too simple, you know, if they're simple enough to explain. So it's a question that I've pursued in research. Um, the project, the research project I did uh, while a master's degree student was uh, projects, uh, three quilt projects that made quilts to give to the surviving families of soldiers who died in Iraq or Afghanistan. And what I can say is from speaking to the women and men who started those projects and were heavily involved is it's captured by the phrase, it was something I could do. They, the magnitude of the losses, the, their inability to affect the course of events that were resulting in casualties was something that was so frustrating. And they found that this is something that they could do that was positive. And in, in the case of these memorial quilts given to surviving family members, their effort was to heal. So it was like, you know, in the face of all this terrible stuff that's happened, let's do something that goes on the other half of the scales. Let's, let's heal the wounds. And quilts, uh, especially like the 9-11 quilt is a good example. You know, 25 blocks in each one, each block is made by a different person. But there's some sort of a charm there in, in that, that it wasn't designed to coordinate, like color, color coordinated or, you know, every block has the same variation on a theme. But like quilts are this sort of open accepting form that can take the contributions of volunteers from anywhere in the world. So the United in Memory 9-11 Victims Memorial Quilt has people from 18 countries that send in blocks. The COVID Memorial Quilt already has blocks coming in from other countries, like I think Australia in particular, um, the AIDS quilt as well. So the, the Wistar family quilt, that was made by so many people. Like there is, there is sort of a, a cohesion to it because it was laid out nicely with stars and things. But still, if you look at it in detail, there's so many different people that contributed. So like why quilts? That's as far as I can get on an answer. I think you're right. I think it's very complicated. And in one of our comments, um, someone pointed out that this is how, what artists do. They use their artwork to explore and express their emotions. And of course, quilters are artists. So why wouldn't they do that? Um, one of our questions you kind of touched on, Jonathan, in your um, explanation, um, you said, um, the question was, are there any quilt exhibits or themes regarding refugees? Thinking about Afghanistan people right now, but also in the past. And you've been very involved. I know one of our other exhibitions was um, the Migrant Quilt Project. Can you talk a little bit more about um, refugees and, and how quilts have been used to express those issues? Well, I should have just put all of this in my presentation, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> here's another uh, slide that didn't get completed. Uh, so please ignore this text. <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed, but I'm kind of happy at the same time. Uh, this was made by Judith Traeger and is part of a series of refugee quilts um, that she made in response to the Syrian civil war. And uh, each one uh, goes through a phase of the process of being dislocated and leaving and eventually finding asylum and resettlement. And this one is called Sacrifice. And it's from an iconic image that was syndicated around the world of a young Syrian boy who uh, the boat he was in either shipped or, or sunk or capsized and his body was washed ashore 
Um, so, yeah. Um, so there are quilts that have been made to address this. This is another one that is in the exhibition. Actually, both of these are in the exhibition. This one is um, made by the Migrant Quilt Project. And this is uh, made for 2018-19, it's Tucson sector. Um, I believe uh, what's included here are the names of 137 people whose remains were found in the Sonoran Desert of Arizona. Um, and these were migrants who left Central America or Mexico uh, in most cases in order to enter the US uh, to seek asylum, uh, but it crossed through the desert because going through established ports of entry had become too difficult, uh, time consuming. And sometimes uh, they were at the mercy of coyotes who they had paid to take them across and this is the way they were taken. Um, so this micro quilt project has made quilts uh, commemorating every person whose remains were found since the year 2000. Um, when the remains have been unidentified, they include the words unknown or desconocido, desconocido, um, which is Spanish for unknown. So I, there might end up being some quilts that are made to um, uh, related to Afghan refugees, and um, I'd be very, I'm sorry that that will probably happen because of the plight that of what's happening now. All right. Um, we also had some people that mentioned, um, particularly um, the applique narrative panels created by Hmong and Cambodian women. And I know that we have one in the exhibition as well. And so the, when they were fleeing from war, they expressed some of those really painful images and, and graphic images of war in their quilts as well. Well, guess what? You've got a picture, don't you? I, do. <laughs> I think this those is, are really amazing applicant panels. Really, I think our, our um, viewers would love to see one. Yeah, let's see if I can get my screen back. Okay, again, the text is uh, incorrect. This is among story cloth, uh, which is applique, uh, actually all embroidered. Um, the, the Hmong, um, it's an ethnic group that resided in Laos and uh, in the 1960s uh, during uh, the Vietnam conflict, conflict under the John F. Kennedy administration. Um, we reached out to the Hmong uh, and asked them to um, covertly support our uh, efforts against the communist regimes that were, uh, was ascending in, um, in Laos and Vietnam. And when everything fell apart and Americans had to leave, uh, there were, just like Afghanistan now, there were many Hmong who had, uh, who were not evacuated. Uh, high ranking uh, among military, some of them were evacuated, but many were left and they became targets uh, of the communist regime. And so these story panels, which have been made in abundance, uh, depict what happened. And there are paratroopers that come in and start shooting. Um, these depict multiple ways of killing. Um, in the center horizontal, like the lower third, you see this band, which is the river, uh, the Mekong River over which they crossed to a seek asylum in Thailand. And embroidered on there actually, which you can't see is the names Laos, north of the river and Thailand, south of the river. So it's, it's interesting that um, it's kind of an, an interesting contrast to me that we have these wonderful memorial quilts that memorialize individuals with such love and and they are they are meant to be something very um, comforting in a way. And then you have images like this that are reminding of us, reminding us of something that is really harsh and really um, a terrible situation. 
but we we have to remember those, don't we? And and I think it's mm -hmm. interesting to see them in the quilt form. I think it's really impactful in that quilt form. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, one of our um, guests asked if you could restate the three themes that you talked about in your previous mm -hmm. research. Uh, the three themes that we used in this exhibition, I think is the question. Mm -hmm. um, the first is that the collective is personal. The personal is universal. And the personal is collective. So the collective is personal is how we look at these things that we often think of in terms of a grand narrative of the heroic sacrifice of war, but we have to remember that it's individuals who died. And that it seems to be what we as Americans are focusing on more now. We're resisting these grand narratives. Personal is, is universal. It's just looking at the common experience of all humanity in how we try to make sense of our loss uh, through rituals and uh, quilts. And then the last, that the personal is collective, that when a person's identity um, somehow is a, re is, a, is a reason for their death or their uh, particular situation within society, both economically, et cetera. And when a number of those deaths occur, then we see something collectively happening that points to something wrong in most cases. Well, thank you. Well, um, I would urge everyone to go to the chat. Um, one of the um, projects that has actually been featured on a textile talk is the 25 million stitches project. Mm. And you can go to the YouTube um, channel where we keep the textile talks and rewatch that program if you're interested. And there are many people who are, who are adding comments about the different projects that they're mm -hmm. involved in and making memorial quilts and and really just the the kind of the healing way that quilts mm -hmm. function when mm -hmm. you're coping with loss. And I think mm -hmm. that that's so true. Yeah. And it, it's something like you said that we can do. And I think that's so meaningful. Yeah. Um, I think that we've covered most of our questions, Jonathan. Um, okay. I, when, I just wanted to ask you though, because I know this was a really difficult exhibition for you to pull together. And is there something out of all of this work that you've done that was just really exceptional or really stands out to you in this experience? I, I'll say two things. Um, one is, the conversations that we had internally and with our outside advisors uh, when we we started asking ourselves what this exhibition actually has to be. Um, I think it was one of the best professional discussions I've ever participated in. As we, um, we really tried, we wanted to be sensitive to the moment and create an exhibition that hit the right tone. The second thing is now going into the galleries and seeing those trees. Yes. And as each day, there's this more and more leaves and being able to go read them. Um, and some of them are very personal, written like to mom or granddad. Um, Others are memories of what was happening on 9-11. It, it's the range of things, but we wanted to give, we didn't want this exhibition to just be so heavy that people would like run out the door halfway through. But I think by providing a way for people to like go through it and deal with whatever this touched in them and giving the way to write it down. Um, I hope that that is actually meaningful as, as much as it looks like it is to me. Well, I know I've been down in the, in the galleries and um, 
it's sometimes I, I, I have to take it in kind of small bits of time because when people come in and you see them begin to kind of absorb what the exhibit is about and then go to that place where they can write memories, I mean, the emotion is tangible in the show and it is it can be really overwhelming but really beautiful and I just commend you mm -hmm. for all that you did to create yeah. this really amazing exhibition, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, so for our viewers, if you'd like to see more, um, our exhibitions are always posted on our website at internationalquiltmuseum.org. Um, you can see all of the quilts and a lot of the um, historic and um, contemporary texts that Jonathan created for the show. Um, I just think there are just so many different ways that um, quilts function in such an important way. And so many of you are contributing um, to different projects that you're involved with um, in the chat. So I'd encourage you to take a look at, uh, at the chat because there's projects here that I certainly wasn't aware of. Um, and, the, and there are so many wonderful um, opportunities to get involved as well, um, if you're interested in contributing too. So, um, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending today, and thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, next week's textile talk will be um, Green and Gather, Growing Communities with Bio Quilts, presented by the San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, so definitely register for that. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you at future textile um, talks. So thanks so much for joining us today, and thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Carolyn. It's been a pleasure. And thanks to all of you who have participated today. Um, I look forward to reading all of your comments in the chat um, after this is over. Appreciate all that you've contributed. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. We're going to look at our sponsors and our wonderful supporters, all of these companies that support us, we encourage you to, to go out and, and purchase from them and support them because um, without them, we could not make these textile talks uh, available to everyone. So thank you to them as well. Yes, thank you.